podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Mostly Photo is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Mostly Photo with Lisa Bettany and Leo Laporte. Episode 10, recorded May 24th, 2011. Chris Marquardt. Mostly Photo is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to Squarespace.com slash Mostly Photo. And be sure to check out their annual plans for savings of up to 20% off. And by... Ford and the 100% reinvented 2011 Ford Explorer with room for seven passengers, best in class V6 highway fuel economy and available sync with my Ford Touch the 2011 Ford Explorer is perfect for your adventures with the family for more information and to submit your photos to the Mostly Photo Adventure Awards visit MostlyPhotoAdventures.com it's time for Mostly Photo. Yes, we're going to talk about digital photography with our great host, Lisa Bettany of Mostly hey, Lisa. Hey, Back home. In I am back home. It's beautiful in San Francisco. I actually am itching to go out and do some street photography. Ah, well, we've got somebody who's an expert <laughs> on the subject. Uh, Mr. Too. Chris Marquardt is joining us. I know you all know Chris because he's been kind of a regular on my radio show for a long time. We've had him many times on uh, various Twitch shows. In fact, he did a photography day uh, last time he was in the States. We took over the Twit Cottage for a day. <laughs> yes. Oh, and, and regular apart from the last five weeks or something. Well, you were kind of busy. Chris, uh, among, yeah. uh, among other things, uh, Guz does a, every year for the last three years, does a trip to the Himalayas. Yeah, we take, we take photographers to... Um, Pretty remote places, and um, we for the last three years, my friend John Miller and I have been taking photographers up to like Ebers Base Camp and to this year to Annapurna and just That's so cool trekking w- to pretty remote places. If I could it? only uh, do this uh, someday, I would. I, w- I like the idea of traveling to do uh, photography. Chris does have a website. Uh, it's HimalayanWorkshops.com where you can uh, find out should, more about You should this. come on one. I'll cut you a special deal. <laughs> oh, you know, it's mo- it's not that money is the time. Well, it's both. But it's, I know. It's, I know. How we, long we, actually, these- we, we actually started to make them a bit shorter. So um, this year it was a uh, two-week affair, so it was okay. <laughs> these are beautiful. Last year it was like more like five weeks, which turned out to be a bit long for most um, people. But five Is it seen- mainly for professional photographers? Or no, no, do no. You- no. Not at all. Not at Everyone? all. Um, we have uh, photographers of all levels with all sorts of different kinds of gear, mostly DSLRs. But um, actually, my, my fiance brought an analog camera, so we actually shot analog up there and um, actually did Wait a minute, You mean about. like film? <laughs> film. Wow. wow. Yeah, that's large format, though. That's medium format. Large medium, is- the medium, I mean. All right. But that's like four by four. What is that? Ours is like this. Wow. So that is, uh, yeah, that's that's like six by six centimeters. Wow. Um, and yeah, when we've been doing development up there, so up, up at like, um, I don't know, ten, twelve thousand meters, uh, twelve thousand feet, not meters. We uh, actually did some black and white development, so it was kind of a fun thing to do up there. Kind of unusual, but. And uh, some of those pictures are on. Uh on the uh, HimalayanWorkshops.com. Are any of these film pictures? Um, no, those are all digital. These are all digital. Yeah. You um, shoot... I'm, what do you shoot? Well, I have a 5D Mark II, and that's been my main go-to camera for the last three years now. Um, I actually bought it... I upgraded from the old 5D to the 5D Mark II, and I bought it three years ago, right before that first trek. And then I, <laughs> I gave it a little test before I... Uh, took the trek by shooting out in the rain without any camera protection. And, <laughs> oh, uh, no. It's kind of a dumb, lived, dumb test. It lived, uh, that's, that's, well, it was on a warranty and everything. And they claim, they claim it can handle some rain. So uh, I, I've I actually that. taken mine out in the snow when I was uh, filming the Olympics in Whistler, Vancouver. I actually went out and it was just like a lot of snow. And my camera was fine. So I think mm-hmm. it can handle a lot that's good to know. more. Yeah, it's <laughs> good to pretty know. Pretty good camera, and it it it, it had to um, it had to take quite a beating and some 
um, some instances up there in the mountains, and it's just, it's just, uh, it just keeps going and it keeps delivering great quality. So I'm, I'm totally happy with it, and I, I use that camera when I shoot um, either for for client projects or paid projects. So when I really need the precision, I need the repeatability. I need to um, to be able to experiment, take lots of shots and. Uh, but uh, for the last about two years, I've actually switched back to analog photography when I shoot for myself because I just find that to be, I don't know, much more relaxing, I guess. Mm. Why is that? Oh, there are a lot of uh, reasons for that. One is it kind of makes you look a bit closer at what you do because you uh, this roll of film, depending on the camera, might give you 10 or 12 shots. So you've got to be more careful. You've got to take mm. a bit more time for each shot. So you, yeah. you have to take it a step, a notch down in terms of the tempo, in terms of the speed, and uh, just work a bit more thorough and a bit more, yeah, controlled fashion. And I find myself getting a much higher keeper rate when I shoot analog. And that kind of translates back into the digital world then. But do you get better pictures? Uh, where? With analog? Yeah, I mean, do you feel like, yeah, that's that's one goal, I guess, is a better a better ratio of photos to. But that makes sense that film because it's so expensive, you're not going to take as many photos. But does that discipline give you a, uh, some better pictures, or is it just kind of a process for you that you like to? Well, play with? For, first of all, photography for me is a bit more than just the result. It's the process. It's um, I have I I just feel so much joy when I when I go through the process of working in, in the analog world yeah. so the, the process of getting there that's uh, it's one of those I don't know probably one of those Zen things <laughs> I did, like you, did you start on film um, I started on film back in the 80s and um, I've then switched to digital and now I've come back to analog partially and it's it's a difference between shooting something and ending up with some virtual pixels on a memory card or holding that roll of film in your hand and, and having something that you really made with your own hands, there is a bit of a difference in feeling about that. For I, me, think that I, I mean, I started on digital. I, I've never shot film apart from a few toy cameras and uh, some lomography, but I, I feel like I, I'd really like to try it out as to really sort of get into photography as it was instead of, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I jumped straight into digital photography. And, and while I find it really, really great to be able to see what I'm doing and to check after the fact, like right away, okay, this is what I've got and to be able to share my photos right away, I feel like the actual process would be quite different with film. Uh, it is, I mean, I mean, I. When I when I started going back to film, I caught myself a lot looking at the back of my camera, going, "Oops, yeah, <laughs> there is yeah. you can't you can't Instagram? chimp. What is that? Uh, Rick Salmon calls it chimping, or uh, what? yeah, yeah, no, no chimp, no chimping on on analog. So this is all and this is all stuff shot with film. And I notice you're using. Are you shooting monochrome? Or are you shooting Ilford or? One of the black um, and white films? That, that is black and white film, developed black and white. And uh, you, you also make some decisions. When you shoot analog, you kind of have to decide for a specific look or a specific right. look and feel because the film already has that built in. Um, it has part of that processing built in. So um, there is film that will give you more contrast. There's film. There's that one for you, Lisa. There's the maple leaf. <laughs> <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Yeah, I held a workshop in Canada last year. So ah, there you that's go. where I brought a flag with me. And um, one so of the reasons to do a black and white is because you can, it's easier for you to do, do your own developing and uh, printing. Oh, yeah, it's pretty easy. But, but well, the printing, I, I'm ch I cheat there. I do a hybrid process. So I do the negative development and then I scan them in and then I oh, continue working on, one, on them in the digital. Oh, that's really well, interesting. Well, the printing, I don't feel right right now. I don't feel like going back to the dark room and um, spending like two hours on one picture because right. that's what you can mm -hmm. easily do. Um, I'd rather have daylight around me. So uh, the, the the whole film development itself happens du uh, during daylight. You do this in a light proof in a light sealed uh, development tank. So that's yeah, that's easy to do. And but uh, believe it or not, I just today received a color development kit, so I'm going to try out my first um, color film, negative film developments. So, I I did learn I'm as, as <laughs> most people of our of my age, I did learn uh, on black and white 
film that you you put you because part of the problem was that it's so expensive if you don't do it yourself it's you know 30 40 50 cents a print that it really right now, it's, yeah. yeah it's it, there, you're not going to be able to take enough shots so i used to roll my own uh film you'd buy it in bulk you'd have a mm -hmm. bag you put feet, it 100 yeah, feet in a roll you yeah. put it on a roller and then you can shoot the black and white film it's not so hard to do black and white development uh, the chemistry is pretty straightforward and then i used to print it too i had an enlarger and i do the printing so you really that is a very different experience in the modern digital photography but i agree with you you do there's a certain it's like cooking your own food <laughs> it's a certain rhythm to it <laughs> which i don't it's, do either <laughs> yeah. it's, it's almost like it's almost like 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 uh, baking your own bread and yeah. um and and also making your own flour it's a, it's a yeah, growing can, your own wheat. Yeah, yeah yeah you can buy perfectly good bread these days or pasta yes. but there is something satisfying to doing the whole thing from soup to nuts and it's the same thing with coffee i know people who buy the beans and roast them themselves and it's not necessarily right. that it's better but uh, but it's about the process i do think it's a good discipline though uh, yeah, and I and I and I must admit, I'm a, still a child of the digital age. So, yeah, that, that's about where it ends. So the negative that goes <laughs> in the scanner that ends up that's in it. Lightroom, and then I it's thought that's digital funny. from I there. That's, and that's um, really funny. Are there I'm other curious to know if you shoot uh, any with any mobile like a. Uh, apps or do you use an iPhone or do you use any because there's sort of this trend of iPhone apps having filters that make yay yeah. <laughs> that make your photos look something like, like uh, camera plus perhaps <laughs> but any, any I do have camera plus, plus on here absolutely oh yeah camera <laughs> plus is fantastic um well but yeah yes and I and I do use some of those but that doesn't give me that process of creating an analog picture so it only gives me the result it only gives me the look but it doesn't really give me that, um, yeah, making a choice what film I use and putting that in the camera, getting out a light meter um, and really learning about, I mean, light that's meter. one of Holy the ways God. I learned about good light metering by shooting analog and having to having old cameras. You get them for really little money. They, they go like on eBay, you find used old cameras for like 10, 20 bucks. Yeah. So it's not an invest, not, it's not a real investment. And uh, but then those might not have a light meter, so you you actually actually I use an app on here to do the light meter. Oh, nice! What app is that? Uh, um, it is called. Uh, da, 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 da. Does it work? Because light meters are They're very expensive. expensive. Yeah, I mean I'm amazed. Um, Lux meter, that's what it's called. And there's a free version, and then you can buy the developer a beer and get rid of the ads or something. So um, that works pretty well. The camera is good, and um, there is enough. API access to the camera to make that work. So I use that as a light meter. I, I tell it, this is the ISO of my film. This is my um, shutter speed. Tell me the aperture that I need, and it'll do that. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Film does have a unique quality to it. And even with processing that everyone's using these days, it still doesn't get that that same quality that, that you get with film. It's a, It's also for me. It's also a matter of trust. It's this um, learning to trust that medium. You have a film. You don't have this instant review capability, which I love because there's no way to learn photography faster than using a DSLR and learning from what what you see on the display. But it's this. <laughs> it's this other thing where you just trust and kind of let the film take over a bit and then later find out what happened. And that's a very interesting thing. It's not for everyone, but uh, it's certainly something that works really well for me. This is a cross-process picture, by the way, that you Oh, let me go showed. back, because uh, we were talking about cross-processing. Um, so that is, a, that, is a slide, that is slide film um, shot as, like a, or developed like a negative film. So what happens is that that skews the colors and gets things look really weird. So it obviously wasn't that green and yellow there. But that's what the film made of it. That's very cool. I spend most of my time trying to recreate film processes. <laughs> and this is one that I actually spend a lot of time looking at it and trying to copy it in post. So I think for me, it would be a great, a great exploration and, and sort of develop my photography in a different way. Yeah. But, but some kind of photography, I still prefer, much prefer doing in digital. And that one of the, those is uh, street photography, which... I just have to shoot lots. I just have to, yeah, I just have to have a card in there that I can shoot 500 pictures on. And uh, it's just a different way of working. Street photography for me is a lot about um, trial and error and um, 
trying to get it right and uh, failing a lot, and then. <laughs> so you, you 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 actually teach workshops on this. I know you you've come to San Francisco to teach street mm -hmm. photography. You said you were in Canada. Uh, first of all, what what do you mean when you say street photography? <laughs> <laughs> Ask five street photographers and you'll probably get five different opinions. Yeah. Um, street photography for me is the, the street photography in the sense of the original street photographers like um, Cartier-Bresson, for example, who, uh, who kind of uh, uh, started that whole genre. Yep. And it's it's about people in the street. It's about... I, I, my street photos need people on them. Mm -hmm. They need um, the human part in them. Bresson took that famous picture. Uh, I'm trying to. It was a Paris street corner, I think. Uh, well, all of his pictures are kind of <laughs> famous <laughs> Paris street good. corners. That's not really narrowing <laughs> it down, is it? Um, but you, you, you. I'll see if I could pull some up, but you'd recognize immediately. But he was taking pictures at, when in the in the 40s, yeah. Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Well, and he was also uh, one of the founders of the of the Ma Magnum Agency. So what you now know as Magnum Photos. Um, was founded by him and um, I think Fred Archer. And, and of course, we talked about him a couple of weeks ago because it was uh, this photo, the decisive moment that was posted on oh, yes. anonymously on Flickr and, uh, yes. <laughs> and, dissed, <laughs> and dissed by a lot of people who said, oh, that's terrible. The kid. I said, well, who would do uh, it? Who would take that picture? <laughs> this is one of, one, of the, one of the things I love about his photography. And he's, if I, ha I, I don't have many photography heroes, but he's one of them. Um, that's one of those pictures where he shows this incredible sense of timing, of geometry, of um, placing things in the frame in really great ways. And almost every single one of his pictures has some of that awesome geometry um, and, and guides the eye towards things. And it's really, really well conceived. And he did that, like this one is, for this example. is another example. Yeah. Yep. Um, he did these things like he, he, he made his decision sometimes of what to take and how to place it within within like fractions of a second. Yeah, yeah, you could tell it's somebody running. It's the bicyclist just going out of frame. Um, so go, going back to street photography for me, it is, um, it's, well, it's a few things. Um, there is the approach where you where you would as a photographer would be um, brave, approach someone, ask them if you could take their picture, and this way get uh, something from them. And then there's the, the way that you see a lot of those uh, Cartier-Bresson pictures um, where he kind of shot from like under under his jacket. Sneaky, or yeah. A yeah. bit sneaky, a bit getting close. <laughs> they, are, they are all very close. He doesn't use telephoto lenses. He always gets in close. You always get the feeling that um, that he's not far from the action. The pictures don't have this like, like a paparazzi kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get this from telephoto lenses. Um, gives you that feeling that more of a voyeuristic feeling and in these pictures you always have that feeling that he's pretty close to the subject he's right and there they know and they probably get surprised right at the click of the <laughs> of the shutter and go what well Qua. with with a, with a 5d mark ii you would probably hear that click of a shutter but he used to use uh leica's leica's are very like, quiet like yeah. very soft very quiet shutter yeah, so yeah. Uh, most people would probably not even have noticed isn't that All interesting of, we we can talk about the legal implications later. <laughs> well, but, yeah. What I, I mean, what, well, I, maybe not later. Uh, before we send people out in the street, is there anything? Uh, do you need to ask permission? Um, well, that that differs in um, that that depends on what part of the world you're in. Mm -hmm. So here in Europe, the official European legislator about this is that you can't actually take a picture of anyone without their consent. That's very different in the oh, U.S. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in the U.S., I believe you can take pictures as long as it's on, on public ground, as long as you don't um, have to take an effort of, like, climbing over a fence or right. uh, climbing up a ladder to see someone. And also um, if you're not using them for money, like you're not publishing them or using them in any way. commercial, right. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then in the U.S., there are very interesting local... Um, laws, for example, well, not even laws, but um, there is there's this one famous law ca law case of a photographer and a Jewish salesman in New York, in New York City, and mm -hmm. and this photographer I don't remember the name, but I think the the salesman's businessman's name is Rosenzweig, and um, you should find it on Wikipedia actually. And what the photographer did is he 
put he, he attached the camera to some scaffolding where people had to walk through and uh, attached some some flashes and then remote released that thing so it was kind of a street photography setup and he made a he took a really interesting and good picture of this uh, businessman and ended up using that in like an exhibition and in, in a book Oops. and I think he made mm. about fifty thousand dollars on that. And then about <laughs> one year, one year later, the businessman sued him. I was like, here, I want my share. And what apparently happened is that um, the photographer um, won the case. Really? Oh, nice. so in New York City, street photographers, I think it's a street photographer's paradise. A lot of street photographers work in New York City because you just, um, it's just easier and you won't run into as many legal problems. Um, I think if he had done that same thing in Los Angeles, it would have been a bit of a different story. You know, there's a, a, a recent um, uh, discovery, I think you probably all heard about this, of a woman uh, named uh, Vivian Meyer, the chat room reminded me about this, who was a nanny uh, uh -huh. uh, and a street photographer who nobody heard of, unpublished, who took many thousands of photos between the 50s and 90s on the streets of New York City it's like a hundred thousand. It's yeah. a huge collection. Yeah, and uh, uh, a, a fella just kind of discovered her stuff because he bought uh, in bulk the contents of her storage locker and found all these photos, and they're amazing. They pictures. are very much in. The, actually, they are. I love those photos because they're very much in the tradition of Katia Bresson. I think yep. um, she probably was a great fan of him. So, a lot of the photos remind me of his work. And and it's just, it's really. I don't know if it's sad. I'm glad she was discovered. Um, but I. You know, but she was completely unknown. She was a nanny her whole life, and no one knew that she. But the people I saw the interview with uh, her. Her employers who said, yeah, as soon as she got off, she'd run out with her camera and mm -hmm. spend many hours. I, I'm not really sure. If I've, from what I've read about her and from what I've heard, I'm not really sure she wanted to be discovered. Maybe. I think she might just have been really happy with um, yeah, with taking her pictures and storing them away. And then this this guy bought like over 100,000 uh, <laughs> negatives, as some undeveloped film. So. Yep. He, I think he's still in the middle of going through that. Thank goodness. All that material, and he's, These are he's now working on a documentary on her. So yeah. I think he he got he got the funding for that through Kickstarter. So he's now doing the documentary, and um, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, this totally is street open. photography. <laughs> I mean, there, but it is, and you're right. I think there's a, there's like Bresson. There's a um, you you feel a little bit like you're a fly on the wall as things are happening. There's no you know it's it's there's nothing posed. It well there's some a posed picture, but <laughs> I take it back. But you do feel like there she is in silhouette. She's quite the artist, really. Just amazing stuff. So how do, do I do how do I get great street photos, Chris? Um. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at these. These are incredible. Well, I think I think first of all you'll have to kind of develop that that sense for something's going to happen here the in a second. Yeah, you have to you have to have this. Um, you have to watch very closely what's happening around you, and you have to keep your eyes very open. Um, I think a lot of practice helps. Shooting lots helps. Uh, I usually go out and do the, do my street photography with a five D Mark II, which is a large camera, which is a what lens very, do you use? Um, I usually go towards the 24 millimeter range for that. Um, sometimes I have my 24 to 105 on there. And, uh, sometimes it's, I have a 24 tilt shift, an old used one. Ah, oh, very cool. But, but if you use that in an untilted, unshifted fashion, just as, as a straight lens, it's an awesome lens. Because awesome it's kind lens. of low quality or? Uh, no, it's, it's pretty good quality. Is it actually. a lens baby or? No, it's a real tilt shift. It's like shift. a real tilt shift. Okay. okay. Let me show you. I bought that used for like, I don't know, 500 bucks. So it wasn't really super expensive. These are designed for, uh, these are designed for uh, view cameras though, right? Um, no, they are designed for DSLRs. Oh, to so give them that is... kind of view camera capability. I see. Yeah. yeah so, so what you have is you have a lens that you can, that you can basically, let me show you, tilt. So you can tilt it uh, by a certain angle which can help you change the plane of focus. Um, 
and then you can you can shift it like down or up so that is a parallel shift which can um usually architecture for the photographers use that to correct for perspectives and things so like like you know when when you tilt a camera upwards to to photograph a building and you end up with all these falling lines these converging lines right. um with uh, such a lens you can you can fix that before you actually go into the digital realm so you, you can fix this before it hit, before the picture hits the sensor which will allow you to not have to change it not have to have the software do do its calculations and the the nice thing about these lenses is that every lens projects an image circle into the camera it's just what they do or lens is round so there is this uh, circular image in the camera and then the sensor kind of is a part of that circle and in order to get those tilt and shift capabilities and make them work with your sensor the image circle of that lens has to be really big compared to what you usually have so now you have this big image circle and you have this small sensor in the middle that kind of cuts out just a small part so it doesn't even get anywhere close to the edges of that circle now that circle gets worse the image quality gets worse the closer you get to those edges and by just picking out that thing in the middle, you basically use the sweetest spot of the lens. You use that part of the lens that um, has the best image quality. So we certainly do do that. And Camera Plus has tilt shift, and I know Instagram does too mm -hmm. in software. But 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 doing it in the real world is really an amazing. Now I've used lens so, babies, which are kind of cheap <laughs> tilt shifts. Yeah, <laughs> the poor man's tilt shift. Poor man's they're a lot of fun. They're, they're, they're fun to play with. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely I'm, definitely this lens is something that I'm really interested in playing with because I've been doing a lot of building shots and <laughs> though I like the fact that they go kind of wacky when you use, you know, a, a wide angle lens, I, I would like to play with something like that. And I think it's definitely a lens I'd love to add to my personal collection. Now with yeah, a I, twenty four millimeter, you have to get really close to your subject <laughs> so do you have any tips for doing that um well again there there are the shots where you ask the subject where you where you approach them and um it helps to give them a reason why you want that picture so on the photo workshops it's usually really easy you go hey i'm, I'm doing this photo workshop i'm on an assignment would you mind me taking a picture and most people will just go yeah sure why not um if you do the more sneaky method if you want to try shooting from the hip well first of all i i would suggest you learn aiming from the hip which uh, is not that easy but no, uh, it good really, really is not <laughs> a good tip here is to go and practice in front of a shop window so you're trying to, to capture your own picture uh, in the shop window and this way you can get a better feeling of um, how, what angle to hold your hand at and uh, how to hold the camera straight because mine mine usually end up being pretty skewed so i yeah uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's just what happens. Um, you should be prepared to have a lot of pictures to throw away because um, I will walk past someone that I think is doing something interesting and I'll fire like five, six, seven shots. Helps if you do it in a busy street so they don't hear the shutter. Um, and then, yeah, I just fire a lot of shots and a bit of a spray and pray kind of thing. I mean, I, I try to get as as many pictures to increase my chances of getting a good one and then I just throw away the ones that didn't work. Now la last episode we were talking about light and how valuable light is in any picture. Do you head out magic hour or do you have any specific times of days that that you find really great for street photography? I find the light that helps me most in street photography is the side of the street that's in the shade. So I okay. usually try to be on there because it's a more diffuse light. It doesn't, um, it's it's easier to work with that because you get a more evenly exposed picture. Um, and then I try to shoot against the wall, not against the street side because, um, because then you have this bright street side on the other side of the street that's behind your subjects. You end up with a silhouette kind of pictures and that doesn't really work. So uh, I try to approach people on the street shooting towards the building on the shade on the shade oh, that's a good tip chris has um, uh, three tips on the street photography we'll get to those in just a second but i want i'd like to take if you don't mind uh, a little break right here to uh, talk about squarespace which is 
the ultimate photographer's friend because every photographer <laughs> I think ought to have a website and if you don't yet sure do have a website uh, Squarespace is the secret behind exceptional websites and a great choice because Squarespace offers both hosting and the software to make it very very easy for you Squarespace dot com slash mostly photo you could try it free for two weeks you'll get by the way with the free trial the full Squarespace so you're not missing any features you'll get to try everything including their 60 plus incredible templates seamless importing from your existing site they, they support all the major APIs and when I say seamless the links work the comments get imported everything and exporting too so you're never trapped full integration to everything including Flickr of course but also Twitter and uh, Facebook uh, of course social integration is very easy to do and you don't have to be a web expert to make a site that fits your needs precisely because all of Squarespace's design tools are just point and click sliders, drop downs that'll give you a unique uh, setup. Here's their here's their uh, Flickr plugin, and you could choose between a thumbnails or a slideshow. Uh, you have complete control over how it works, custom text and so forth. Here's Twitter. And any generic RSS feed as well. A good idea if you're thinking about Squarespace to host your uh, your your own professional site or your site as you start to become uh, kind of more professional. Maybe just a place to show friends and family what you're up to. Take a look at uh, Squarespace's photography examples. If you go to squarespace.com, look at the examples page. There's a whole photography tab. These are pros who use Squarespace. To show off their stuff, I love the Shutter Sisters. We'll go visit their website, squarespace.com. If you go to squarespace.com slash mostly photo, click the green try it free button. You can try it free for 15 uh, days. No credit card needed. Uh, every Squarespace site is unique, and they really are a great way. So, you know, look, you don't, you've got your own art to worry about. You don't want to have to worry about web design. But this will make it look unique and beautiful, and that really is the key. Squarespace dot com slash mostly photo take a tour take a look give it a try for two weeks make sure you check out their annual plans for savings of 20 percent as well hosting plus the best darn software you've ever seen squarespace dot com slash mostly photo we thank squarespace so much for supporting mostly photo all right it's time to get chris to give us some street photography tips well um the first one i think and i've it's not it's not really specifically for street photography but it works um this is for is, everything this is for everything <laughs> all for photography, all photography yeah. and that is if in doubt get closer it's one of those very simple things you hear it over and over i'm I've, i'm not the inventor of that by far not but it is one thing that i find over and over again, that it really works and really helps your pictures because by getting closer, you will make it a bit more clear what your subject is, what the picture is about. Um, you'll, get, you'll get rid of some things that would otherwise have been in the frame that might have been distracting. And uh, in general, you will, you will make the picture a bit, bit stronger, a bit more clear. And then if you get really close and you start cutting off things, that's where, where the magic starts happening because where, as soon as you don't show everything in a picture, you will open up the picture for interpretation for to the viewer's imagination. Oh, interesting. Because, so because there's, there's sort showing. of the fill the frame. That's something exactly. you hear a lot. Fill the frame with your subject. But then when you're starting to cut things off, are there any places on human bodies that we don't want to cut off? <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of against rules, but there are a few things, and one a few things that I consider pretty much rules. And uh, one is where to cut off or where to not cut off a human body. And um, it's pr it's pretty simple, actually. Try to not cut through the joints. <laughs> that is one one of those yeah. rules. If you if you cut through the knee, it'll kind of look a bit like an amputation. If you cut I'll give you an example. This is a photo I took in South America. <laughs> cut right through the knee. Yes. <laughs> cut right through the knee. Everybody looks like they're about to fall over. It's not good. 
Yeah, or or the ankle, or yeah. the wrist, um, yeah. the elbow, these, or, or or the neck. Some of these will just look weird and will look funny. Um, if you choose something in between the the those uh, joints, it'll typically be much better. With the exception to not cut below the knee. That is also one of those rules. Um, cutting below the knee. Yeah, again, kind of feels weird. You, most people will want to see more of, of well, more of the person, including the feet. Then, yeah, I mean, this was the problem in this show photo. Is <laughs> trying to get the mountains, and the pro I did take pictures where I didn't cut them off, but they're tiny. You well, know? you could have you could have either tried I, to go more wide angle, go a few steps it's, back, it's maybe it's maybe hopeless. crouch down a bit more. It's hopeless. I think this is actually a crop. <laughs> I, I think actually somewhere I have the the full the full photo, so I'll just go back and. What do you feel about cropping uh, chins and foreheads? I, I mean, I I shoot a lot of portraits and. You know, I'm kind of back and forth because sometimes you see some documentaries that have extreme close-ups and they will cut off the chin Yeah. or it's... they'll frame it sort of here. I usually try to cut sort of forehead hairline out if I'm doing an extreme and always leave the chin in. Well, I personally, um, I don't mind pictures of me without the chin because I mean, less, <laughs> less chins. <laughs> so that, but that's, that's just my personal preference. Um, I think it really depends on who you shoot. I mean, it will, it will really change the character of the person if you cut off the chin or if you cut off the hair. Um, what I usually try is um, cutting through, if I cut through the forehead, I will try to not cut cut right under the hairline because that can look that can make the person look as if well there's no hair coming <laughs> right. because people will that's what happens you, you see this uh, the surface of the forehead and people will just extend it that's what happens and um if if, I, if you include just a little bit of the hairline that will kind of uh, give that okay there, there's hair and that'll make the person look more like themselves or if I have to go really close and I'll cut closer to the eyebrows, that also works kind of. This is me saluting, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tip number two, don't believe the hype, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, you know how, how photo industry is. Um, they're, they're trying to sell you these magic pills to make you great photographers. Oh, I just bought that $2,000 tilt shift lens you recommended. <laughs> And that just made you such a good photographer. I was, I was disappointed so many times when I, when I bought gear, and I kind of obviously knew that it won't make me a better no. photographer, but then secretly kind of hoped that Hope it would show eternal. my pictures. Yeah. And then um, I was kind of disappointed a lot of times. So I think that there is no magic pill in that new camera or new lens or photo accessory of your choice. Um, it's probably people trying to make money or at least in many cases i totally admit if you have a if, if you have a special need if you need to shoot sports and you need to shoot lots of bursts and stuff you might want a camera that's fast and has good autofocus so there are definitely some technical reasons for certain gear but in general it's still the photographer who takes the picture so and today, even the cheapest entry level dslr even with a kit lens is capable of providing really good quality so i would uh I, I usually don't suggest really expensive lenses because um, I think people should first start working on their photography and get better with what they have and then and then kind of find out over time what they actually need. So what do you feel so, like the most important thing is when you're just starting out? What do you think the the biggest, like the easiest way to improve your photography? Well, the fastest way certainly is um, for me to do a bit of chimping. So I take a picture. I um, I have a quick look at the quick look at the display just to check for like not even composition. Usually, like for the the histogram to get some idea of the exposure. I think learning about exposure is a good and mm -hmm. important thing. Learning about where to put things in the frame is a good thing. Um, just basic composition rules, um, or not even rules, but design principles, um, talking about the subject, about framing, about lines, about um, shapes and forms and textures and things. Um, and there's a lot you can learn in a pretty short time. So these are the start of things. And then I think people just should just be 
free to experiment. I think that's really important. Um, you have a tool in your hand that you can take thousands and thousands of pictures and delete the ones you don't like. So make use of that. And uh, your third tip actually is great for uh, street photographers. It's actually <laughs> great for everybody. This, is a, this isn't just for photographers. This is for everybody. Yeah. Don't worry what you look like when you take pictures. <laughs> And don't worry what your gear looks like. That includes not just you. It's also about the equipment. Um, I've used such beat up cameras and things with held together with duct tape. And um, <laughs> I just I just know that a lot of the great photographers are pretty much ready to throw themselves in the dirt to yes. get that one stunning perspective yes. or climb up on something and look weird or have a camera with them that is kind of unusual and people might stare but uh, in the end you might get this one awesome picture when i go out uh, analog shooting look at what i'm taking with me this is kind of a pretty <laughs> not not that inconspicuous camera with a pretty big lens on it and um people look people stare people go even come up to me and ask me what that is um but I've I've learned to not really worry about that too much. It helps if you if you want to learn that if you want to work on that. Uh, it helps just going out with a with a friend, um, fellow photographer, go on a photo walk, and you will kind of learn that actually it is not that hard to to do that. And yeah, it's good advice in general. People want actually everybody assumes people are looking at them and thinking about them. They're not. They're wondering what you're thinking about them. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, we're going to take a break. When we come back, uh, this is something we started doing a couple of shows ago, and I just it's my, it's my new favorite thing, Lisa. Favorite, your favorite photo, Chris Marquardt. You could explain how you got the image, what, what your thinking was behind the image. Uh, Chris will explain his photo, 6.30 a.m. in just a bit. But before we do that, I do want to tell you about our Mostly Photo Adventures contest. It's on. It is on, baby. And uh, <laughs> we've got our photo award winners and our finalists for next week. If you go to mostlyphotoadventures.com, you can uh, see everything. Well, this is a great site in general to find out what, what's going on. Our photo walks go there and everything. But uh, it's also where you could find the finalists so you can vote on them. Uh, we've got week six finalists, but let's start with our week five finalists. We had three beautiful images Lisa selected from Tress Chapin, C.M. Ortega, and Visual Ideas. And Lisa, you decided to give the Editor's Choice Award to yes. this... Lake. I just wanted to hear you pronounce it. So. Yeah. No, I don't know where it is, but I like it. Lake Eskilstuna, the sixth. I'm uh, a big fan of reflection shots. Me too. They're really difficult to get, yeah. especially since water is generally <laughs> wavy, and it's and this one is is practically perfect. So well, I love and it, this it's one. also HDR, which you love. It's Trey. Blame Trey. Yep, blame Trey. <laughs> this is from uh, sw uh, Sweden, and uh, Visual Ideas is Heinrich Sundholm. Uh, Heinrich, we're going to send you a $100 Amazon gift certificate as our winner this week. And then we, uh, we allow people, encourage people to tweet their favorite. And uh, I like it when it's different because then we get two winners. Uh, CM Ortega, Carlos Ortega, one with this one from, uh, looks like from Rio de Janeiro. Hmm. Rio, it's I think sunset. that's my favorite part about this contest, just seeing people's slices of life from their hometown or their cities, just like Sweden and Rio, and just seeing all these shots from all around the world. It, it makes me feel really proud that we have such amazing photographers great? listening to this. Isn't it great? Uh, this is another $100 uh, Amazon Certificate Award winner going out to you, Carlos. You should visit, everybody should visit, because there are so many great pictures. Our mostly photo group pool on Flickr, flickr.com slash group slash mostly photo. And there are 2,280 members. There are more now. We've crossed 10,000 photographs. <laughs> wow. Holy cow. Chris, <laughs> I'm... It's amazing. 10,102 <laughs> photographs on here. And this, this week, I'd love to set the theme as uh, animal pictures because I've seen a lot of really great ones. And because the topic has been landscape and light, I haven't been able to choose any of them. So I'd love for this week for it to be animal photos. Pictures, finally, pictures of your kitty. You've been waiting. You can <laughs> yeah. now, I hate cat pictures so much, but we will find three great cat pictures. <laughs> well, there are other animals in the world. It doesn't have to be a cat. All right. <laughs> make it pictures. Make it pictures of cats riding Roombas. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. It's a narrow, it's a narrow, narrow topic, but I think a good one. No, you sh you should see how many videos of that are on YouTube. So <laughs> I know I've watched them all. <laughs> well, we have That's crazy. No, please, no cats writing Roomba videos. <laughs> no, 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 no. We do have three great finalists for this week. Uh, and these were landscapes again from... Uh, oh, this was for light. Light. That's right. Light. light. So these were just spectacular, demonstrating ja different qualities of light. Jamie uh, Martorano, uh, Jared Rapolato, and Monty M are our finalists. Actually, let me go to our finalists here. Well, these are amazing pictures. I I've always wanted to take this photo. I'm so yeah. jealous of this. I've always wanted to go to the Is Grand Canyon. Price? and. Wow, oh, yeah. It's just gorgeous. Uh, really spectacular. Page, Arizona, yeah. And then, so that's Jamie's. Um, the Bay Bridge, we're right here. Jared Rapolato, uh did this one. Another spectacular use of light. I really like how the ocean looks in this picture. Long exposure, yeah. Yeah, isn't that neat? Great effect. And then uh, Monty M., Monty Montgomery's uh, Hurley Sunset. Another great reflection photo that just captured mm -hmm. the light in a unique way. So here's how you get involved. You go to uh, mostlyphotoadventures.com, and you click the finalists tab, and you'll see those three finalists. Now, here's how you vote with a hashtag. So Jamie's is the hashtag Mostly Photo Award 16. Jared's is Mostly Photo Award 17. And Monty's is Mostly Photo Award 18. So we have two Amazon gift certificates to give away, one for the judges winner of the three and one for the People's Choice Award. You now have to vote through May 29th using those unique Twitter hashtags. Winners will be announced on our next Mostly Photo Show, which is May 31st, 2011. So you, but you get your vote in sooner, May 29th at mostlyphotoadventures.com. And we thank Ford and the 100% reinvented 2011 Ford Explorer for uh, helping us out with this, for providing the website, and, uh, and, and uh, of course, the gift certificates for our finalists. And, and look, go back and look at some of the great photos that we've got in our, in our uh, finalists here. I mean, just some really spectacular photos now. It's a whole 18 of them at mostlyphotoadventures.com. All right, speaking of photos, Chris has picked a, uh, one of his favorites to show us. It's called 6, not 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. Because <laughs> I took it at 6.30 a.m. I'm, I'm a fan of titles. By the way, I think everyone should title their photos. Um, I don't really like going on Flickr and seeing pictures with the title IMG underscore 352 point. Chris is on a crusade. He's been on this crusade for as long as I've known him. And I am the worst because I, you know, it's an, all I can do to go through yeah, my you photos. Do that, yeah. You want me to name them? Oh, for yes. crying out loud. Yes. Well, the, the, the problem is how do you name a picture? And I usually go for the very simple thing. I look for something in the picture that might just be a word in the picture uh, or uh, an, an object in the picture. So I'm ready for simple titles. Um, this one, yeah, 6.30 a.m. because it happened on 6.30 a.m. Um, it's a picture I took last year on last year's Himalayan trek. And it shows... Um, well, what I like about it is that first you'll have to kind of explore it. So it's not really obvious right from the beginning what it is. So you'll, you'll have to spend some time. It, it really doesn't show everything right from the beginning. So um, after a while you will find out that, there, that these are tents and then there's someone in that tent in the foreground. And there seems to be some fire or something in there. And in fact, it's one of our yak herders. We had like 35 yaks with us and uh, 12 people herding them, they carried our stuff and the tents and things up to the mountain. And um, those yak herders had this very simple tent, most, more, like a, more like a tarp um, and a fire inside the tent that they kept going over the night. And last year I was really in that mode of having my camera with me all the time, every single minute. And we got up really early and I was just out of our tent and, um, but I already had the camera with me and I saw this scene and it just took me like, I, I had the opportunity to take this picture for about 10 seconds. That was when the fire was bright. That was this, that's when the guy was moving and he's actually putting on, um, putting on a jacket there. So that was like a window of about 10 seconds and I was 
I was really getting hectic because um, <laughs> if you try to shoot this kind of a picture with a camera on, on any automatic setting, it'll get the exposure wrong. Right. It yeah. needs, it needs sure. to be darker than the camera wants it to be. The camera doesn't see much light, so the camera will brighten it up and try to make it look like a daylight picture. But it's not a daylight picture. It's a 6 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. picture. <laughs> and um, I I was really like, frantically, okay, let me go to manual mode and let me try this and, and wow. get exposure down. And I took one test shot and that came out too bright. And I corrected that and uh, quickly took a second one. And that's the second shot. And you, you don't have the time to take 10 on this one. This is it. Not really. And and yeah. it, it, the other reason I like it is because it's, it shows some contrast between like the, well, if, if you know the situation, there are the yak herders, um, there are the Sherpas, there are the tourists, which was us. And um, there's a bit of a hierarchy there. So the yak herders only have those tarp tents, but the Sherpas have real tents. So you get this a uh, bit of a of a social contrast in there oh, as well, if you if you know the situation. And then just from a very formal point of view, uh, that picture has a pretty strong yellow blue primary color contrast, right. and I kind of like that. So you've always very, paid a lot of attention to color. I know. Uh, it's important. I think it's really yeah. important. And those primary color contrasts are just Again, a very um, almost a very simple trick. Um, if you learn to see them, if you learn to see the blue, blue orange, and the red green contrasts, um, you can make a lot of your pictures more interesting by including some of those in there. I and, think that um, those are two great points. One, always have your camera with you and ready to go. And mm -hmm. two, if you can get familiar and comfortable with shooting in a manual mode, you're going to get better pictures. And I think for a lot of beginners, that's something that's really tough for them. Do you ever shoot on aperture priority or are you mainly always a manual shooter? No, no, mostly, mostly 95% uh, of my photography is an aperture priority. That's, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I learned to trust the camera that it does the right thing most of the time. And I, mm -hmm. I know the situations where the camera will definitely get it wrong. So that's where I do some exposure compensation where just, I, I, I know mm -hmm. that if I shoot this for example, this bright surface with this bright wall, I know the camera will get it too dark. It will end up in, with, as a gray wall. And mm -hmm. I know that I have to dial in plus one, plus two stops of exposure compensation to get that right. And, um, but then even I don't always get it right. So that's what the chimping is for. I have a quick look. <laughs> I see the I'm still off. So I take, take a second picture. That's the advantage of digital. You can do these quick shots and then have a quick check and correct what you did. I love it. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I always shoot on manual because I don't even trust aperture priority. But there are those circumstances where I completely miss a shot because I'm on manual and I've totally messed it up. I think I I jumped into manual really early on and, and that way I feel sort of comfortable with it. And I've shot a lot of video on, on manual as well. Um, but do you have any tips or tricks on how to get manual to work for you if you're just if you're just starting out well if you want to try it out in in the good old days before all those all those uh, <laughs> exactly. built-in light meters and stuff photographers had to kind of gauge it play it by ear um when it came to exposure and there there's this one rule that uh, is called the sunny 16 rule I'm not sure if you heard of that um mm -hmm. what it says is that if you set the aperture on your lens to f16 um your Shutter speed should be the same as your ISO. So if you're on ISO 100, um, your shutter speed is a hundredth of a second. Uh -huh. If you're on ISO 200, your shutter speed is on a two hundredth of a second. And that will get you a good exposure for a subject lit by the sun. That is the starting point. That's a yeah. good thing to know. But my Go wife's outside, uh, F16. My and wife, you won't even my have wife to shoots with a, a, a OM-1, which is a, one of the classic Olympus film cameras. Very good one. The meter is broken, mm -hmm. and that's the rule of thumb she uses. She says, "Oh, I know. I'll just you know I'll set it to 16. Mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> and uh, she's you know what? More often than not, she gets a great shot. Yeah, and then if you if you if you get if, if there's a cloud in front of the sun, mm -hmm. you just either open up the aperture a bit, right. or you set the one hundredth of a second to a fiftieth of a second, expose twice as long. And um, so that rule of thumb, that starting point will get you pretty far. And uh, and then you'll be there. And if, you, if you're if you a bit off, 
we all know you can still correct for like half a stop, a stop in Lightroom um, or in, in your in the software of your choice. But um, in general, that will get you quite close to where you need to be. So light meter, who needs a light meter? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever find that your display isn't isn't accurate like do you yes. use uh the histogram or do you use the blinkies to know if you're overexposed because sometimes when i look at my picture in the viewfinder it, it doesn't look like it i know that i've got the shot but it looks too dark or it looks too bright so in that case do you then switch to the histogram and read that to get your information well do, do you have the uh, do you have the um do you the have brightness the brightness turned on? up <laughs> Z you're looking for the you word you're looking for is zebra, Chris. How do you have well zebra is in video? <laughs> oh, oh, is they not call it zebra in still photography? We don't have zebras in still well, photography. What you're video saying is you can zebras. set your camera so that if an area is overexposed, it will blink. It blinks. Yeah, or, I if call it's, them or if it's if it's clipped or if it's underexposed, you can set it. Some cameras will set it that it'll blink if yeah. if there's no detail. So the problem is with those uh, new cameras, the 5D Mark II. If, even as, if it's not that new, it has this setting to auto to automatically change the brightness of the display depending on what light situation you're in. No, so if it's bright good. around you, it'll go brighter, um, and so on. And that is very distracting because yeah. the the display kind of keeps lying to you a bit. Right. So looking yeah. at the picture on the display doesn't really work for me. Maybe for a quick focus check to see if I get what I want in focus. But um, I use the histogram. I I've learned to work with the histogram. I know by looking at the scene that I just shot, what the histogram is probably going to look like, like if it's more going to lean more to the right or to the left. Or sometimes I, I have intentional overexposure. So I, I know that I want it to be cut off on the right side. And that's what I usually do when I chimp. I look at the histogram. Yeah, to me too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the actual composition is already in there. So I don't really care about that much, much more. But the histogram is the thing to look at because that is that is the thing that it doesn't lie to well <laughs> it's not quite yeah. true it does <laughs> does kind of lie to you a bit because um what happens is that the camera no matter if you shoot raw or jpeg the camera will always make a jpeg it always does that and it embeds that jpeg into the raw right. file and it uses that for the preview and the so fun it'll always fact, be kind of crunched well the, yes and the fun fact is that uh, the the shooting, what is it called on Canon? The picture style that you chose, if it's like vivid or s standard or contrast. Your I've landscape. never actually used any of those. I, do you, I haven't do you either. Well, then, it's, then, then your camera is set to standard, which actually kind of raises the contrast. So the JPEG you get embedded in your RAW that you see on the display is that JPEG based on the picture style. So ah, what happens okay. is, that, is that the picture style changes the contrast and the contrast change means the histogram gets kind of pulled wow, apart. Wow, I had no idea. Wider. So you, you end up, we end up with the camera telling you, well, you end up with the camera giving you a nice punchy picture on the preview because that's what yeah. most people want. But it also gives you the histogram for that punchy picture, but the raw file might have much more information. So you potentially end up seeing blinkies where the raw file still has, has plenty of information in the clouds or something. Yeah, so I think that's I've, when you really have to trust yourself. And I know I a lot of people that are shooting, say, a fashion shoot will have it directly plugged into their computer so they can actually view the raw files. But if you're just out in the field, it's just, I feel like for myself, I just have to kind of trust that I know what the settings are. And because recently I've just found just not matching at all, like what I'm taking the picture and then I bring it up in the raw and I'm, oh, wow, okay, this looks okay. I, I actually got this shot, but in the preview, it doesn't look like anything. And and you probably get the experience, so you know you know how far you can go until you have too much overexposure that you can't rescue anymore. Um, so I think that's that's where you really have to, where everyone has to take time with their camera and learn the equipment and learn mm. to to know what the light meter does and how it exposes in certain situations. We're going to take a break. Chris Marquardt is our guest. He is the host of a great podcast of photography called Tips from the Top Floor at TFTTF.com. Uh, a couple of times a week, and it's, and it's really a teaching show. It's really great for learning about photography. Uh, and you, you, you've probably been doing that longer than almost anybody. You, you started early on doing that show. I started early 2005. Yeah. So not, not quite a pioneer of podcasting, but... Pretty close. Second round. <laughs> I think that's how we met. 
Uh, he's also a regular on my Tech Guy show doing uh, photography tips, and um, we're so glad to have him on. ChrisMarquardt.com is his website. He is Chris Marquardt on Twitter as well. Now, let me spell it for you. <laughs> C-H-R-I-S, that's the easy part. And get ready for the con consonants. M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-D-T. Marquardt. Chris Very is simple. based in Tübingen, Germany, but does uh, workshops all over the world, including the Himalayas and the U.S., and you can find out more on his website, chrismarquart.com. Our show today brought to you by the great Ford Explorer, the new 2011 Ford Explorer, which has been completely reinvented from stem to stern. Room for seven passengers, the best-in-class V6 highway fuel economy. EPA gives it 25 miles per gallon. That's an awful lot for a car with uh, this kind of size and style and power. Uh, Ford's really d done an amazing job at making very good engines that are fuel efficient and yet powerful. It's a 3.5 liter V6, 290 horsepower, 255 foot pound of torque with the optional towing package. You get 5,000 pounds towing capability. Plenty for a boat, a camper, or a trailer. And still get that great highway mileage. It's pretty impressive. Lots of room inside. Uh, three rows, seat seven, but you can also fold down seats to give you an incredible cargo capacity, uh, up to 80.7 cubic feet of space. And, of course, I would be remiss if I mentioned a Ford vehicle and didn't mention the incredible Ford Sync with My Ford Touch. The My Ford Touch is kind of Sync Plus. You get an 8-inch screen in the center console, two little screens behind the steering wheel that allow you to control everything, not just, you know, your phone calls, music, navigation, climate, everything. The whole car is at your fingertips. Uh, it's just a really beautiful vehicle. We always rent one when we can get on the road and uh, and do these shows. We always like to get a Ford Explorer for ourselves, and this new 2011 Ford Explorer is spectacular. Will you try it at a Ford dealer near you? Tell them, tell them you heard about it on Mostly Photo. We'd appreciate it. And don't forget to visit the website, mostlyphotoadventures.com, to learn more about the all-new 2011 Ford Explorer and about our photo walks, our finalists, our official rules for our contests, and more. Thank you, Ford, for making a Mostly Photo possible. MostlyPhotoAdventures.com. we got about uh, five minutes left, Lisa. Should we have, uh, what, what would you like to do? We have questions from our audience, but we also have, uh, I know Chris probably has some things in his camera bag that are pretty cool. Oh, I want to see what's in his bag. <laughs> what's in your bag, Mr. Mark? What's in your bag? <laughs> well, first of all, we're say, we should say, for those of you who are listening, we are looking at Chris in his studio uh, where he does rock concerts as well as do you do a lot of studio not shoots? really concerts no it's, 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 it, i used to record some bands oh in there. That's okay a bit of a different thing uh, okay do you do uh, <laughs> do you do studio shooting in there um yes i do and i, I usually like bring out everything's folded away in those um, lockers back there right now right. and i then kind of bring everything out and then it starts looking like a real photo studio and then Everything gets packed away because I start falling over things, and <laughs> so it's a it's this changeable space. It's this uh, space that morphs into different kind of well, as it things. should as it should. You already showed us your tilt shift lens. I, you know, I was looking. It's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because Canon has reintroduced tilt shift lenses for the first time in eighteen yes. years, and there's a new L tilt shift, a twenty four millimeter tilt shift L. It'll set you back over two thousand. So bucks. over two thousand. <laughs> don't don't even. I, you, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have bought this one if I hadn't uh, if I didn't have the you opportunity said five, to get it. Five hundred bucks. Is that with a Canon mount, yeah. or is did you have to uh, get That's a, a Canon adapter? lens? Yeah, yeah, with a Canon mount. Wow. So I was I was really lucky. There was a an architecture photographer who, um, yeah, just bought a new one, got rid of the old one. That's probably I don't know six, seven, eight years old and pretty beaten up. But hey, the glass is okay, and that's what counts. Well, and your point is, of course, that this is a specialty lens you won't use all the time. So you don't well, spend two grand on it. It's there's, there's no point in shooting with that lens if you don't really have a need or if you get it cheap and just want to experiment. That's what I did. Right. So what else I you just got in there? Play with one. Yeah. Um. Well, I do too. I'll, Obviously, the 5D Mark II, that's yeah. with me all the time. What lens uh, is that on there? That's a 51.4. Mm -hmm. That's um, The, the 51.8 is kind of a must-have if you don't have a prime lens. Um, 1.4 is one step up from that. goes a bit brighter, um, but costs like three times as much. So, The 1.8 um, is a great lens I always tell awesome. everyone to get as a first. You know, if you've just got the kit lens... Buy that one. It's a hundred dollars, and you'll take amazing pictures with it. Yes, absolutely. Um, then I, uh, 
this beast I just showed you earlier, that's actually <laughs> an old an old East German medium format camera with a um well let me show you the lens that has been made in Ukraine. Ukraine so made in a, Ukraine. <laughs> wow. So this this is a fun thing to play with and just just listen to the sound of that. Oh man. Wait, wait, wait till you hear the shutter. Oh, baby. <laughs> That's solid. Can I ask you, uh, you what what film do you use? Um, I have actually I have some here, all sorts of film. Well, for for this kind of a camera, you would use um, a medium format film, so they come. You like Ilford like, or? Uh, uh, so I use Ilford. I use some Rolleiflex films. I use some Kodak. So you don't uh, really care. Fuji. Um, depends on them. I, um, courses for horses. Whatever need, whatever is required for what I want to do. Sometimes I need this very contrasty black and white film, so I use an older, uh, autochromatic type of film. Right. Sometimes I used to love the uh, Kodachrome, uh, the Kodak 400 ISO. Uh, oh yes. Tri what do they call then it? Tri. Trix. Tri X. That loved that film. Kodak That's a classic. Tri they still make it. Absolutely. Where do you get your film? Yes. At the um, film store, the, Lisa. <laughs> online the stores. Film store? <laughs> if you if you go to look, I don't know, B and H Photo, for example, has a lot of uh, analog sure, films. Oh, wow. okay. they actually actually Kodak just brought out a new analog film, a new negative film. So wow. the, there's there's a pretty pretty lively community there around um, film photography. I do remember that Fuji Film, for instance, did have a different color cast. I think. Uh, it's green. It's very green. Yeah. So they're really they're just because it's black and white doesn't mean it's all the same. There's definitely uh, different different as you said courses for horses. Yeah. And then one last thing in my camera bag. I sometimes take that with me. Um, is one of those toy cameras. Um, this is the Spinner 360. What the hell is that? Oh, cool. Yeah, I've seen that. Is a 35. If you go to my photo sets on on Flickr, there's one called Spinner. And um, this camera takes 35 millimeter film and it exposes the entire film, including the sprocket holes. So you get like the entire uh, size of the film and it rotates 360 degrees and while taking a picture. <laughs> so you end up with a you end up with a picture that is like five times as wide as it's long. I love this. Uh, as it's hot. And, um, Very cool. And, and I, have, I have yet it's to... It's a Lomo. Put some it's a Lomo, yeah. I have yet to put some color film in it, but um, there are just so many fun opportunities under the under my group shot set. I have a group shot taken with the spinner uh, on one of the workshops. How do you um, how do you uh, get this developed? How do you get it processed? That's just regular film processing. So they will process it for you. There's no special film in there. Um, you can put regular negative <laughs> film in there. Um, drop it off at your drugstore at the corner, and, and just tell and them not to it. cut it. Well, not to cut it, and the problem here are the sprocket holes. What they they expect the picture to be closer right. uh, to, to to not include the sprocket holes. So, in this case, I scanned the entire thing, including the sprocket holes, on a flatbed scanner. And oh, you scanned it in. Interesting. I scanned it in. Yeah, that's yeah. scanned that's, negative. That's yeah. how he does it, folks. He's crazy. <laughs> he shoots he I'm, shoots film, but then he scans it. <laughs> well, I guess you have to though, because you want to post it on Flickr and so forth. So as long as you're going to scan it. There's a, there's actually a little little cheater app for the iPhone called Inverter. It's free, and all it does it inverts it inverts the picture from the camera and gives it to you inverted on the display live video. So um, I kind of use that when I develop a negative. I use that to kind of have a first look at the pictures. So I get this this negative look of a negative. So yeah. I'm I'm very confused. <laughs> <laughs> it, it says, you say it's got a field of view of 400 degrees. Well, it, it spins around more than 360. Look, let me show you. So lens is pointing at you right now. Yeah. Now I pull the string. I let go. <laughs> it turns over. It turns over. So, so it, it does one spin and then a bit. And that's, a, that's all one exposure. That is one exposure. There's a slit of light that hits the, the film, and the film is being transported while the camera rotates. That is so, and 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 it's not blurry. Uh, no, the exposure time itself, um, if you look at this little slit that hits the film, is probably in the range of like a hundredth to two hundredth of a second. So, it's it's a really and now of course you're always in the shot. 
well, you can hold it over your head and try. And I did this a few times, but it never really turned out that well. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. You have a whole blog post on it. If people want to uh, learn more, uh, visit uh, Chris's uh, blog, which is chrismarquart.com. Well, that's th you've got some really cool toys in there. You do. I, I love, love to get in there. Just yeah. poke around. <laughs> wow. And, and you can uh, buy I this will, uh, spinner? Soon, you can get that online. Uh, Lomo has a lomography.com, I think it is. Uh, they have an online store. Not affiliated, but I used to shop there a lot because... It's a very, cool very cool site. I, I look at it a lot for inspiration of post-processing, actually. Wow. Yeah. Me too. All and right. Very soon, my, my camera bag will have one of these um, large format cameras, but a foldable one. So that's my next purchase. Ooh. So I can nice. take it with me. It's nice to be a pro because then you, then you can justify exactly. these, <laughs> these purchases. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Well, Lisa, we have some questions. Uh, would you and uh, Chris like to uh, put your thinking caps on? Sure. I'm All ready. right. Start with uh, Patrick Chang. Who says a quick question? I hope you can answer on the show. What makes a black and white photo great? I've been wanting to play around with tools like a Silver FX Pro by Nick Software. I love that; it's a great uh, piece of software. Um, but I wouldn't know where to start. Can you uh, can you discuss um, uh, what you think separates the ordinary black and white photo from an outstanding one? Does it have to do with, for instance, shadows, um, highlights, subject? He has a picture. He said, he says, I converted in Lightroom and lightened up my nephew's face more to make him stand out more. Um, I like that, by the way. If you want to, when you ask a question, if you want to share a photo with us, you're, you're always welcome to do that. Let me see if I can get this photo to show up here. Do, 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 do. But you want well, to I think, Chris, you're, you're, the, you're the black yeah, you and white expert. You want to start on yeah. this one while I pull up the photo? Oh, this is kind of well, a neat well, photo. One, one of the things that I find really important in black and white photos is good contrasts. And that yeah. those are mostly defined by the black point. So um, what happens when I scan a black and white photo is that it comes out not contrasty enough. So um, I usually, in, in Lightroom, I just slide the black slider a bit up to make those... Black's really black. So um, where I'm kind of cautious to underexpose in color pictures, in black and white pictures, I'm actually never really afraid to let some shadows just disappear but, into black. In fact, if there's a flaw in this picture, maybe maybe that's it, is that it, it seems a little overexposed. Um, I kind of don't mind that. I mean, he doesn't yeah. seem to have too much detail on the shirt there, but um, that could, well, that could be a creative decision. That could be on right. purpose. It's Do you also, worry about highlights disappearing with black and white photos? Um, with black and white, well, it kind of depends. Usually I try to preserve the highlights and um, film gives me a lot of options there. And then Lightroom gives me another few options <laughs> there. So um, I usually try to preserve the highlights, yeah. But then some pictures... Do you ever use I the recovery? Yes, absolutely. Slide. Recovery is a very important thing. Yeah. Especially in raw photography. That's a slider in Lightroom. It is. Sort of people is wonder. It all the time. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Hey, uh, thank you for the uh, question and the photo, Patrick. It's great. Thank you for sharing with us. Here's one from Jamie Jones. Hey, Lisa and Leo, love the show. Just wish, <laughs> <laughs> just wish you'd have a photo walk down in Australia. Cough. Oh. <laughs> photo walk down under, eh? That'd be awesome. Hey, I think Lisa and I can both say we would love that. Yeah, we really would. <laughs> we'll be right there. And I, and I would, I would join in. Would you? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, totally. I have a question for the show. For someone looking at getting into flash photography, flash photography, by the way, we've got to get strobist on the show soon. Yeah, we do. Yeah. What external flashes would you recommend? I know that you'll also need a pocket wizard for your camera and a flash for more unique flash uses, but would you stick with a flash made by your camera's manufacturer, Canon, on, uh, or would you use a Canon on Nikon? I use a Canon Gear 7D, so would you go for a Canon or a different brand for your first flash? I'm quite undecided, as my fellow photographer friends tell me to get a 500EX if I can afford it. Or, I'm sorry, 580EX if I can afford it, as it's something I'll have for a long time. Wondering what your thoughts are on flash. 
Definitely the Canon. <laughs> if you've got a Canon, get a Canon. Um, I use the 580 EX2. I just actually got this flash. Yeah, it's amazing. It's awesome flash. Um, I have been using the 430 EX and the old 580X for the last four years, and they've been great. Um, I use Alien B's CyberSync triggers. They're a lot cheaper than the Pocket Wizards. I might upgrade now, but they're a great starting point for someone who doesn't have tons of money, but they're very, very reliable. That's the Paul C. Buff Alien B's CyberSync triggers. Great. Chris, you have anything to, to add to that? Well, I'm more on the strobist side, um, which means I usually don't go for the TTL stuff. I go for manual setups there. and I So before you uh, stop, <laughs> TTL is through the lens metering. Through the lens metering. And uh, the, camera, the camera and the flashes, when you use them, like if you use that Canon flash on a Canon camera, you will get this, um, all the magic is going to happen automatically. The flash will do pre-firing and measuring the flash and measuring the, the environment. And uh, the camera will do uh, pretty good things. Um, but you don't like that. Well, I do like that if it if I have to get the shot quickly, but if I have time to set it up, I like to go the manual route and just set up flashes with the different outputs and put them in different locations. And um, that and that doesn't require the, the specific flash. It just needs a flash that can be set manually to a certain output level. So I have like an old SB28 from Nikon and... Uh, Chinese made no name flash and <laughs> like and and a 580 EX2 as well but um I usually use that in manual mode so that uh, the, I get to decide how much output it fires but then I have to do test shots and get the exposure right and it just takes a bit longer but um that's basically what David Hobby does the strobist and um you you should get him on the show we're absolutely. working he's a yeah. listener and, and we're working on getting David on absolutely i think if you're if you're just going to buy one flash and you're going to use that flash for both off camera flash and on camera flash buying the one you the said Canon, is the right yeah it's it's going to be easier to learn and Good. for people who aren't as technically savvy as you are <laughs> it might be tricky for them to add, you know have three different flashes and all that thing so and certainly for me i like uh, a flash i can put on the camera and, and shoot events and weddings yes. and that kind of thing and then take it off and then use it for for oh, and that's, then that's where you want all the TTL metering and all the exactly. uh, making sure the camera and the flash really talk to each other and know what they're doing. So um, absolutely. And that's that's what I use it for in that mode when I shoot an event or something. Mm. Um, but but when, I, when I shoot for myself or when I'm when I'm in an experimental mood, I just try to. You like the challenge, know. don't you? <laughs> it is a challenge. Yeah, I like doing that. It's way too interesting in the process. <laughs> hey, Chris, always a pleasure. Chris Marquardt is a Chris Marquardt dot com c h r i s m a r q u a r d t dot com follow him on twitter with the same name uh don't forget the tips from the top floor podcast it's wonderful tfttf.com and for more information on his workshops um where would you where would just you go like to my homepage okay just chris marquardt it's, it's all, there. all there everything he does and i know this summer is coming up so that means you probably have workshops all over i'll be in the united states in august yay hey Yay. Coming up next week on uh, Mostly Photo, uh, my old friend, Mikkel Oland, uh, who uh, is a great photographer. Uh, he's a guy who did the Lightroom Adventures in Iceland and uh, it took me to Tasmania in Australia and had a blast. I know you're taking the week off, Lisa, so uh, Trey Ratcliffe will fill in for you. So Trey and Mikkel Oland, next week on Mostly Photo, you can watch the show. We do it live. Uh, every Tuesday, right after Mac Break Weekly, about 4 o'clock Eastern, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, uh, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. But if you've missed the show, don't worry. Twit.tv slash photo is a place to go. Thanks to Ford for uh, supporting the show. And don't forget to go to mostlyphotoadventures.com for our finalists to cast your vote. we got to get your votes to give our People's Choice Award. by and post your animal picks. Animal picks. <laughs> it's going to be your favorite one. You know what? It's It'll be bus. fun. It'll be fun. I have to find an animal. It doesn't have to be a pet. You can go out in the wild. Could, be a, could be a safari. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Great to see you again, Chris Marquardt. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining you. us. We'll see you next time on Mostly Photo. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.